Excellent. Happy New Year, everyone. What a way to welcome in 2022 with so much unexpected snow and cold. And here we are nice and bright and warm today. And hopefully it will stay that way. and We won't get another another pounding like we had over the, the new part of the week. So welcome. Um, I'm thrilled that we are doing these again. And I think for anyone who did not participate last year, um, you missed out on some great speakers and very informative panels. And it was so successful that we decided we need to keep these going. And the list of potential speakers is boundless. And I'm, I'm thrilled that we have a very close to home group with us today. Um, and I will briefly give them just um, a, a quick intro and then let them get right into what they're going to be speaking to. But, you know, there's this, this old adage that says all politics is local. And I think that came from former Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, way, way back in the day. But you all know how important our local governments are to the work that we do. And whether it's a comprehensive plan or a zoning change or a flood mitigation issue, workforce housing runs the gamut. We stay in close contact with our local government elected officials, their staffs, our executive management, who we are, are just so fortunate to have with us today. And we thought this would be a great way to kick off 2022 because we really are trying to put an increased focus this year on our outreach to and engagement with our local governments. COVID sort of upended a lot of our lives from everything to how we, we work, to how we play and how we interact. And I know we're, we're seeing some spikes in the, in the variant and we're having to do some additional retreats but I will tell you that I've, I've missed being with the four individuals who are with us today and, and their teams. And I, I wanna thank all of them and their staffs for helping to work with me to coordinate their being with us today. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all more often and getting really into the details again like we were pre-COVID of so much that's going on at the local government level. So I wanna thank them all. Um, let me introduce each of them just quickly individually, and I'm not gonna take up too much time because we've only got an hour and I want them to feel like they've got time to engage and then we can have some interaction with each of them following um, their remarks and their, their brief presentations. So we have with us my friend, Michelle DeWitt from the city of Williamsburg. Um, you all might recognize Michelle because she had been the economic development director until recently, and she's now the assistant city manager. Um, and I'm so proud of her for being in that role. And Williamsburg will certainly be benefiting from her years of experience in the city. So Michelle, welcome. It's good to see you. Um, we also have joining us the county administrator in my home county of James City. So we've got Scott Stevens, and I'm thrilled that he's been able to be with us today as well. I actually was in um, the James City County Government City, uh, James City County Government Center, Scott, right before Christmas, and I was drop some, dropping some things off to Anya. You were on the phone, or I would have stuck my head in the door and, and said hi, because it's it's been a while since I've actually been able to see you all in person. So I'm thrilled that you're with us too, and it means a lot to me that our, our hometown guy is right here. So I appreciate you, Scott, and I appreciate all of your team and, and your time. We also have with us Rodney Hathaway from New Kent County right down the road. Um, you all might know that the eastern portions of the county actually are, are somewhat within the Williamsburg area footprint. So we, we can't really say that we work exclusively with New Kent because we share the, the county with the Richmond Association of Realtors. But I really love the fact that we get to engage with Rodney and with his team. We've got some good things going on with New Kent this year that, that we'll be hearing from. Um, and and we'll, we will let you all know how we are engaging with the county as well. So welcome, Rodney. It's good to see you. And I'm glad that you are here too. And I think somewhere on here is, I hope, Neil Morgan um, from York County. I'll, I'll put Neil last in the queue and I'll ping him and just to make sure that he's all squared away. Um, but Neil is the county administrator from York County. And we've worked very closely with Neil over the years 
even back when he was in city management in the city of Newport News. And when he came to York County, it was such an easy transition for us as the realtor community because we worked so closely with him when he was the um, city manager in, in Newport News. We are very engaged with York County right now because they are going through another comp plan review. Um, and, and we are really engaged the best we can be in terms of sharing data and resources with our local government leaders. And again, we want to enhance and increase that engagement and visibility this year. So what better way to start our public policy power hours in 2022 than with this incredible group of panelists. So that all said, um, when I reached out to them all, this is how I sort of squared this away so that they would have a good idea of what might be helpful to all of us um, on the, the Zoom today. I thought it would be a good idea to first hear from each of them as to what are the current issues? What's going on right now? Um, second, what are some recent successes? It's something that you really are proud of that perhaps even during COVID, you felt like you were able to achieve and, and, and be positive for your county. And third, and maybe most important, what's on the horizon? What do you see coming in the short term, maybe in the long term? And I, I know with the city of Williamsburg, we've actually worked on gaming some of that out on some housing issues that I know Michelle will talk about breaking some of the action items down even to you know, less than a year, a year, five year, 10 years. Those are really important metrics. And so maybe we can even hear a little bit from our local government experts on how they're working toward the next decade um, within their community. And I think what that will do for us is for, for you all, especially um, for our local realtors, it will pinpoint exactly where those engagement opportunities are and how we can have more um, input and um, connection to our local governments, which is so important. So with that, Michelle, why don't we start with you? Um, you are the only city and um, in, in, our, in our little region. And you know, it might be even good, Michelle, if you could quickly just explain the differences between how cities and counties even function in Virginia, because they are vastly different. So welcome to all of you. I'm glad you're here and we'll have you out of here, hopefully within an, um, an hour or less. Well, thank you, Susan. Um, everyone, I'm Michelle DeWitt. And as Susan mentioned, y'all are used to seeing me as the Economic Development Director, stepped into a new role in August as Assistant City Manager. Um, but you'll still see me around. <laughs> so um, cities in Virginia, to answer your question, Susan, are highly unique. We are independent cities. I think all of you um, in the real estate business have have figured this out and learned this. Um, we're the only state in the nation that has independent cities. So what that means is our cities are not part of the county. We are like a county. <laughs> so we, you don't see that overlap where in, in other states, if you lived in a city, you would also live in a county. Here we are independent. Um, we also have a moratorium on annexation um, on cities in, in Virginia. So we cannot expand our boundaries. Um, and that happened um, in, the, in the 80s, um, I believe. And, and we like to joke from the city perspective, um, Scott, Rodney, and Neil will have a different perspective from the county perspective. But as soon as the, the suburbs, the growing counties in Virginia outnumbered the cities in the General Assembly, um, they put an end to, to annexation, which you could understand why they wanna hold on to their, their taxable areas. Um, so some unique setups for, for cities in Virginia. One thing, um, typically we lament that that, um, that causes us harm or, or disadvantage at the federal level because they're not used to dealing with cities that are independent. In the case of the ARPA funding that everyone heard about, it actually ended up at our advantage um, being an independent city. We're also a non entitlement city, we do not receive CDBG funding from the federal government. Um, and so that actually benefited us in our ARPA funding. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our ARPA funding. We, we received a little, a little over $18 million, which was, um, you know, that's a investment of a lifetime for a city the size of Williamsburg. So I do want to highlight that. Um, so let me jump in. I do have a PowerPoint to help keep me on track because I could just go and go and go. So bear with me and I will share my screen. 
and hopefully Hmm. Sorry, guys, trying to queue it up to start moving. We can see it. You can see it, but it's in its mm -hmm. non. Um, oh, I'll just leave it. That here. looks good, Michelle. That okay, good. it's not perfect, but you can you can see it and you can see what's coming up. <laughs> so the first thing I wanted to talk about, I thought was really relevant to the real estate community is something we changed in the city. It started January 1st, so a couple of days ago, is the way we're doing assessments of, of properties um, for our land book. So typically the, the assessments had been on the fiscal year um, and we've changed that to a calendar year. So I wanted y'all to be aware of that. That makes a lot of work for our real estate assessor, Derek Green, who's, who's amazing. A lot of work for him right now because he is starting the assessment process six months earlier than he normally would. Um, so you're seeing that process move, but it really helps us be more efficient as we look at our land book and our values and plan for our budget every year. So this should better inform our budget, which is approved typically in April or May, um, sometimes June. Um, so we will have more data about real estate assessments and values going into our budget process and under, our finance director will understand better the implications around our tax rate. Um, so that was something I thought y'all would be particularly interested in. The next thing I want to talk about is just the, the vision um, that the city has. We, the city council adopted a new vision statement um, right before COVID. My life right now feels like pre-COVID, and I guess we're still in COVID, so um, existing COVID. Um, so this would have been the fall of 2019, and you can see our statement here. Um, and I don't think any of this will surprise anyone, but but that we're, a, we're one Williamsburg. We're an equitable city that's courageously leading, um, innovating, and to be modern. Um, we know we're rooted in history here in the city, but we, we are also part of the 21st century. So we're innovating towards that, um, remaining a modern city, remaining relevant in the 21st century, um, prioritizing the safety and wellness um, of everyone, engaging with our partners. And three of our partners are on the call here today, um, the, our, our counties, um, York, James City, and New Kent. Very important to us that when we do anything, we consider the impact on our par partners. Um, at the end of the day, we have to do um, what makes sense for the city, but we also have to be very aware that the Williamsburg area is greater than the city, and, and we have um, conversations with the partners. I mentioned the counties on the line today, also with our two big institutions, um, Colonial Williamsburg and William and Mary. So good relationships there, and, and we always want to make sure that we're not, we're not doing harm. And then lastly, this goes along sort of the 21st century um, discussion. We want to make sure we're connecting with the world, that we remain connected. Um, many of you will remember the stories of when, when Hummelstein was president of Colonial Williamsburg. Colonial Williamsburg was the landing place for international visitors um, to this country. Um, they would come here and recover from jet lag before they went on to DC. Um, and we just want to remain relevant in the world and remain um, modern as we move forward. So that's the backdrop of the city's vision our vision 2040. And so you see some themes that are common there um, nationally and globally ab about equity, about courageously leading, about being safe and well, um, and remaining relevant. Then I wanted to dive in just really quickly um, to the ARPA funding. Funding. I mentioned um, earlier that the city received eight, 18 and a half million dollars in, in federal funds. And that is like I said, that's an investment of a lifetime for a city the size of Williamsburg. So city council wanted to be um, very strategic in how they use these funds. The mayor liked to say um, it wasn't to, to buy clothes to put in the closet um, that you won't remember two years from now, but this was to invest in things um, that will make us healthier and stronger in the future. So, so big investments. Also, um, council encouraged us to think outside the box. I don't think you typically think of governments as doing that, but we really tried to stretch as we brainstormed um, things that could make a difference and have a positive impact in the city. Came up with 80 plus ideas to start at the staff recommendation levels, and then it went through a process. You can see 
Um, we had a steering committee um, review, um, we had a community survey, and then city council had a two day retreat to hone in and give staff direction on, on where to go with these, these funds. To give you some ideas about um, how we tried to be thoughtful and strategic, um, we had a steering committee of seven members. You see them there, um, the vice mayor, the mayor, um, head of our finance and audit committee, um, William and Mary president, um, CW president, um, the city manager and myself. We really talked about how, how do we focus this discussion? You have 80 plus projects. Um, what, how do you, what criteria do you, do you use? And so we came up with these criteria. We wanted it to be, um, to think about being broad-based and equitable to, to everyone, um, to have an impact um, on the quality of life. And then not something that necessarily would, would create new operating costs, realizing this is a one-time fund. What can we do to expend it, um, considering that, that a lot of projects will require operating costs over time? How do you overcome that? Um, we also looked at projects that didn't have other funding. And then lastly, I thought this was really important. The group talked about, we need to have an early win. So you have 18 and a half million dollars. The public and ourselves are gonna expect to see something. So as we, we rated and looked at projects, we looked for things that, that could move forward pretty quickly. Um, to, and also there are restrictions on the funding to be used pretty quickly by the federal government. Here's where we landed. Um, you can see um, it's $21.4 million because the city actually did take some money out of fund balance. Um, that, those funds were, were from our um, historic triangle marketing um, fund, the half cent um, sales tax that comes back to the city. So this was the, the overall package. And I'm gonna just go through a couple of the, of the bigger projects. You can see um, it's far reaching. We also, we have some big projects I'm gonna cover. We also had some CIP acceleration. So our CIP had been put on hold because of COVID um, and revenues being down and just a concern that we needed to be, to be cautious, rightly so, we did. Um, so we also, there's $2 million going towards um, acceleration of some CIP. And then three and a half million to go towards um, city council every two years does what the business sector would call a strategic plan with projects that are above and beyond our daily activities as a government. Um, and, so, and so we have every two years a new set of projects. This time around, I think we have about 26 projects in that two-year plan. Um, and so they put some funding towards those things to move those forward. And then lastly, smart city technology. Um, I spoke a lot about our vision, wanting to make sure we remain relevant um, in the 21st century. So we're looking at ways to install some smart city technology um, that will set us up moving forward. So this can do all kinds of things. It can read your, your water meters remotely. It can, um, it can test your air quality. Um, we're also looking at it as part of a, a parking system. So it can, it can monitor parking and help make sure there's parking available downtown. And I may have already hit my 10 minutes, Susan. Um, I'll give, let's see your slides. I, I, um, let me see, it's 12.20. I still don't see Neil. I don't know, Cindy, did he come into the waiting room? Okay, so I've sent him a message, but I have not heard back from him. Um, all right, why don't we give, in that instance, let's give you a few more minutes, Michelle, and then we'll pivot to, to Scott, because I know you've got a lot of good stuff to talk about. Yeah, well, I just want to quickly highlight a few of those big projects. Um, one is a, a downtown um, redevelopment project here across the street from the library and the police station. Um, we have a, a public housing um, facility that's at the end of its useful life. So this is a, a redevelopment downtown um, to, to make sure our downtown, we know we're no longer the only place to do business and and come, you know, we, there's lots of places to do that in Greater Williamsburg, we, but we want to make sure Williamsburg remains one of the places people come down and, and have a good time and spend their, their time and money, time and treasure. Secondly, um, working with uh, William & Mary on a research village and tech center. So as William & Mary grows, um, how can we spin that out? Um, is there an opportunity to do a tech center um, as most universities have this. So we're in conversation with that and council has put some seed funding towards that. 
Thirdly, um, consideration of building an amphitheater as part of our sports uh, facility complex at the visitor center um, that Colonial Williamsburg owns. I want to emphasize the visitor center is not going away. You see that here um, in red. This is on the acreage around it. There's opportunities to develop other things. Affordable housing. This will be my last one, Susan. Um, affordable housing is something I know y'all are very interested in and city council just um, issued a, a report on affordable housing. I'm happy to share that with y'all. It's pretty easy to consume. It's some difficult um, information. First, we had to define what's affordable housing in Williamsburg. You know, that's different everywhere. And, and the federal definition uh, is 80% of median income is not always affordable to our workforce. So um, we talked about five things. Again, I'll send this report out. It's pretty easy to consume. Um, we talked about um, converting hotels to apartments. We've done that twice in the city. Um, we talked about redeveloping um, that blatant building project I mentioned and including um, affordable housing there. We talked about doing some workforce housing that the, the city would actually own. Um, and encouraging mixed use and mixed income projects on Capitol Landing Road. And then lastly, looking at some CDBG funding that we could compete for from the, at the state level to help invest in existing neighborhoods and keep them affordable and strong as neighborhoods um, that already exist in the city. And I'll turn it back to you. That was good, Michelle. I really appreciate that. Um, I'll, I'll just drop in here that Michelle and I um, worked very closely. Um, I was part of a, a couple of work groups recently on neighborhood balance issues in order to keep the, um, the quality of life and the unique characters of our, um, of our neighborhoods, particularly around the college. That was the Neighborhood Balance Committee or the NBC and the Affordable Housing Work Group um, that I was a member of as well and worked very closely with um, the city manager with Michelle, with Carolyn Murphy, who's just retired as the director of planning and the zoning administrator. But some of the things that Michelle just mentioned really um, emanate, emanate, emanated from that particular group or those groups. And there's a lot of, of progress being made in the city's affordable housing overall framework. And it was, it, was, it was a great exercise and I'm so glad we did it. And I think there's a lot of work still to be done Yes. Um, but you, you all can thank yourselves for helping to provide some data and research to the city around all of those um, issues that we are still discussing. So thanks, Michelle. That was very helpful. Um, we'll have time for q and I hope here shortly. So Scott, I'm going to tee it over to you and you can give us a, a good, good bird's eye view of what's going on here in the JCC. Right. All um, Susan, I assume you can see my screen. Did it show up? Yes, sir. I can see it really well. Okay. All good. Well, I'm going to talk really fast because that works better for me. I have more to share than I have time to share, sort of like Michelle. So I'm going to move through it. And if we have questions later, I'll leave contact information and certainly would encourage folks to call, follow up with me. Again, I am Scott Stevens, the James City County Administrator. I really do appreciate the invitation to come and speak. I think it's really good for us to hear from you and for you from us and have that interaction. And I certainly want your membership to always feel like they can call and get answers to questions or things that might be occurring or they're hearing within the community that we ought to be aware of or could help them. You know, I think our challenge in government and particularly local government is acting in a manager in a manner the majority of our citizens support and want. Um, and I would encourage you to contact our board of supervisors. When you have issues in the community, they want to hear from you. They've appreciated that interaction. And also recognize that no matter how they act on an item, which way they vote, somebody likes it, somebody doesn't, and there are a lot of people in the middle that maybe didn't know what was going on. So just because they didn't vote your way doesn't mean they didn't listen and they don't care, because that's not true. I talk with them enough to know that they are very committed to this community and are working to what they believe is in the best interest of the majority of our citizens. From our employee standpoint, I just don't want to miss the opportunity to tell you that I expect our employees to be courteous, respectful, and efficient. I think we succeed at that most of the time. Uh, we're in a regulatory position, particularly dealing with contractors or builders to tell them no an awful lot or write tickets if you're a police officer. It doesn't mean we have to be unfriendly. So if you've experienced uh, something good with our employees, I'd love to hear it. If you've had an unpleasant experience, I'd love to hear that because we can learn from both. And then finally, before I move on, as you read or hear something about activity in the county or what the board did at a meeting or what I said somewhere, 
please don't hesitate to call or email to get the my side of the story. I'll, what I'll try to do is give you the whole picture and maybe not just the snippet you heard. Uh, you may still not like the outcome, but at least you'll have what I think is the best information that we made our decision or recommendation upon to share with our board of supervisors. Um, I do want to move through a couple of these slides. I want to start, I guess, with COVID. We all have heard enough about it, but this Omicron variant uh, has really been uh, pretty widespread throughout the country. That's true here in James City County. We're looking, we will follow cases daily. Um, this happens to be December. Uh, and for us, uh, December really picked up the number of cases overall. So we had 657 cases through December 27th. And the next week following that, or not quite a week, we had another 1,200 cases. So again, it is really pretty significant in how it is moving through our community as well as others. The good news is hospitalizations are down, the vaccinated tend to not be those that are in the hospital, uh, and it tends to not be as severe for those that contract uh, this new form of COVID. Uh, well, I was on a call with Riverside and Centera today where again, they reiterated the same things that you're hearing nationally. Again, most of those folks that are in the hospital are the unvaccinated, the cases of, of others are not as severe. And so at this point they're holding their own, but they're busy as well. Um, I want to move to American Rescue Plan Act funding. While we didn't get percentage-wise or dollar-wise near what the city of Williamsburg received, it was still substantial. Our allocation is $14.8 million. We've received half. We'll get the other half this spring. We went to our departments, asked for what they would want us to do, and we recommended 21 of their requests to our board of supervisors, which they approved in concept in November 23rd. They really fall into six broad categories of affordable housing, uh, community uh, items of business and nonprofit grants, some support positions to handle this additional workload within county staff, uh, to accelerate some CIP, uh, a few new projects that had not previously been in our uh, capital improvement program, and then some tourism related items. Really, the most significant, there's some proposal about a marina potentially in the restaurant area or the or restaurant in the marina area. Uh, we would do parking lots, stormwater improvements, water and sewer to serve that facility should that come, and then trying to make the Ambler House, at least its grounds, uh, more presentable for events. We've held some events there and had some weddings and other things there, but having portable bathrooms, better electric, better landscaping, uh, and the stage we can move around in the community, I think would benefit some of those kind of activities. Uh, departments can move forward with most of these projects, totaling just about $5 million. We've held about $10 million of these projects, one, because I don't have all the money in hand, but more importantly, the Board of Supervisors asked us to come out and hold some community meetings and just see what our ideas are out there and make sure the community is supportive of these projects as well. So we will likely do that in the March timeframe. Uh, we spent a lot of time over this past year, or maybe two years, looking at uh, county buildings and future needs. We started with a facility space needs analysis that uh, was completed in August of 2000. Uh, we have about 320,000 building square feet that we use. Uh, in 2020, our need is closer to 469,000 um, gross square feet. So we, we don't have enough space for what we're doing today. We have people crammed into offices that if you walk through, I think would be pretty surprising to you. Uh, as we look to 24, the need is really closer to over 500,000 gross square feet. So that led into a facilities master plan that's underway and will be presented to our board of supervisors. They've had some interim conversations through 21, but they'll see more about that in 22 and early in the year and we'll recommend improvements. And some of the larger projects for us would be a relocation of the government complex and where that might be, a general services complex moving out of Tooney Road and where that might be, leaving JCSA likely at the Tuning Road complex and expansion there. And then what do we do with our human services center? Do we stay where it is or does it blend in somewhere else? And then a number of fire station renovation and replacements, not really moving them, but replacing some of those. The other big study that we had going on this year that will be out, I think in that same time frame, probably the same meeting, is to talk about a waste consolidation and collection. The Board of Supervisors was very interested in this as a study. Uh, we've been talking about it my whole three years here. We just had it completed and presented November 23rd. The results of that study, I will tell you the surveys we did at the community, residents are extremely satisfied with what they have today, but they would likely use the services if offered by the county. So that puts the bar pretty high. We're stepping into something that the citizens really think works really well. And so the only thing we can do is make it just as good or worse. And so we've got to be very cautious of stepping into something where our citizens already have a very high rate of satisfaction and to make sure we don't do something bad to them. 
Uh, the costs of the services would be somewhat less. Percentage-wise, it's significant. Dollar-wise, maybe not so much. But with multiple providers, it's around $30 a month is the average, which would include recycling. It's $22 a month if we had one provider. You just get more efficiencies if the county were to do it or hire one single contractor to do it all. I think we'd have more service options and bulk items, leaf and limb collection, other things of that nature, appliances. The big surprise to me was miles traveled. Because we have all these different providers in the county, we're traveling more than 6,000 miles per week, generally with large trucks, uh, to pick up people's waste. If we had one provider, that number drops to something like 2,200 miles per week. So I think that's a significant change of large trucks in your neighborhoods and on our streets. Um, the other thing that was surprising to me, many neighborhoods have one collector that the streets go out on Wednesday, they all go back in Wednesday night, but we have a lot of neighborhoods that have two or three providers in that neighborhood. And so they may have a container out on Monday and then a container out on Tuesday and then another one out on Thursday. So the street never really looks great because there's always these containers sitting out. So these two are really big benefits beyond the cost. So we'll see, we do anticipate holding some public meetings. Either way we go with that, we'll have some people happy or sad because we've heard from enough of them to know either way we go, we'll have some happy or sad. And that's the nature of what we do. I hope you know that we've just, just just adopted or the Board of Supervisors did our 2045 comprehensive plan. That process for us was about a two year process that started in the spring of 2009. So we got ahead of it right as COVID roll in was when we were trying to do our public involvement. So we did most of our public involvement through virtual uh, fields, and which again was a little challenging, uh, but we had a what we thought was very good participation, more than 1,900 individuals, 11 organizations, and again, over a two-year time frame with 38 meetings and, and a lot of volunteer time going to that with our PC Commission Planning Board members. Um, really what came out of that, some scenario modeling. I'm not going to read through all of these, but I'll have them up there so you can go back through as this is being recorded. Uh, but a lot of good information that came out of the, this round of our comprehensive plan. Um, Moortown Road was, was out or was in, was out, was back in. So it's back in our land use designation for some, some considerations uh, going on there. And again, I won't read that to you, but our board of supervisors did unanimously approve uh, this update at their October 26, 2021 meeting. Uh, some upcoming developments that I think I will, will play on um, just to give you some quick things of what we're seeing, we have about 10,000 parcels that could be developed or dwelling units today. By right, they've been approved in the past. The developers would take what's out there. They can do that without any further board of supervisor action. So there's a lot of development that can occur in the community if a developer wants to go by what's been previously approved by a board some years ago. Some projects that are coming forward today, this one happens to be on next week's board of supervisors calendar, uh, Ford's Colony, the continuing care retirement community. Um, I'll let you read the list. Some other things coming up this year that we're aware of, some Stonehouse tracks, uh, the plans we expect in early 22 with some action or construction starting in late fall. We have a Stonehouse track 11A, another pretty significant uh, addition out there. The plans are again expected in early 22 with construction starting late summer, uh, early fall. We've got the Hazelwood Village Center that was just approved. We don't have an anticipated construction standpoint. This was a very controversial item for our community and our board. It was a 3-2 vote for our board. A lot of good points on both sides, but it's one of those areas where the majority of the board felt that allowing this master plan in light of what was by right development that could occur out there was better for the community in the long run. Uh, but opinion's still pretty raw on that in terms of varying and some uh, not as happy with the outcome and then others very pleased. So. Another one that is back, it was um, project out around Oakland. We expect, expect this one will go forward. It already has board of supervisor approval uh, in terms of it was approved some years ago in a different name. Uh, and again, a different developer has picked it up. And as long as they develop it according to what has been previously approved, it could move forward as well. Um, final thing I wanna talk about, at least in terms of slides, is our first ever 3D printed house uh, in the US that Habitat just dedicated the week before Christmas. Uh, it's out in the Forest Heights neighborhood. It was really interesting to watch them print the outside of this with concrete where they had a, basically a printer structure, as you would see in a smaller model, print the outside of this house, and then they framed it up on the inside in a conventional manner. A very attractive house, a little more cost uh, to build this house initially, but the thought is long term, these will become a much less expensive home to build because of the ability to do this 3D printing. Uh, it was much quicker in terms of getting the outside of the building built. 
uh, and is expected to be more efficient. And they have a really good partnership with the Virginia Center for Housing for uh, Virginia Tech, I think, for doing the monitoring air quality and utility usage within the house. So they can prove what they say they believe will occur in terms of housing. Uh, two other things or three other things I'd like to just mention. We all have slides, but I'll put contact information back. Uh, one is a sports, sports um, complex. Um, Michelle alluded to that, but we did form a historic triangle recreation authority. We were talking about city, um, Williamsburg, James City, and York County working together to build a basketball facility with the idea that we would bring tournaments in this community during the weekends. We would have gym space for our community during the week. I think it is a very uh, positive uh, project for our community, but we will have more information to share in the coming months. The first meeting of this newly formed authority will be sometime in January, and I think we'll have regular reports out to our boards that will talk about that. But I think there is a lot of excitement around this project. If you don't know enough about it, I'd love to talk with you more to make sure we have help you understand it so you can make a decision to be supportive of not because it will have its critics at what as well. It's about a, a 20 or 30 to $40 million project, depending on what our estimates end up being. The facility itself doesn't pay for itself directly, but overall uh, impact in the community definitely, in my opinion, and based on the studies we've had done, uh, will pay for itself. So I think it's a very good project. We did open up unofficially a dog park at Veterans Park. It's been extremely popular uh, throughout the um, this uh, last month, we have our marina construction project that's going on of redoing some of our dockage. Uh, it's about nine months behind where it should be, but a very popular project. And then we finished up a project at the Chickahominy Riverfront Park. So a lot of going on, not enough time to talk about it all, but happy to talk later. So with that, Susan, thank you a lot. No, thank you so much, Scott. That was extremely helpful. Um, I know there's a lot going on in the county right now. And I do want to thank um, your staff, particularly Tammy Rosario and her team over in planning. We participated in one of those online um, engagement opportunities on the comprehensive plan. And it was rather early in COVID. I think it was probably May or June when we had, were in that first few sector of, of uh, shutdown. But it was easily... Um, shared and I think it was helpful to everyone who was involved. We brought in our Virginia Realtors economist, Lisa Sturdivant, and we, are, we were able to walk um, the county through the data points that um, Dr. Sarah Stafford had helped to prepare as an update to some housing research we had conducted several years beforehand. So I hope it continues to be helpful and that we will um, continue our work together and, and try to be as resourceful for you all as you all might need us to be. And always just know this really goes for all of you, um, Rodney, Scott, Michelle, hopefully Neil, um, that we're always here to, to be a resource to you because we've got access to, to data and, and to research that most organizations don't have because of the, the various MLS um, systems that are within the region. So we're here to help and we always want to let you all know that we're ready to, to be your partners and do what we need to do to, to forward your mission and our mission as well. So that was extremely helpful. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of, I'll, I'll tell you guys, I'm kind of excited about this Ford's Village opportunity. Good, good, thank yeah. you. So, yeah. Um, it's going to be a beautiful development. I, I, I know the developer well. Um, he developed East Beach and the Cavalier, and it is he does nothing that's not top shelf. So that's that should be a, a beautiful outcome. Um, so, Rodney, there you are on my screen. You are the upper right hand corner. Yes. So, yes. Good to see you, my friend. It's been way too long. Yes, um, I'm so glad you. you're here. And there is always exciting news coming out of New Kent County. Um, I know that we, we have not done this forum. I think Cindy and I were talking when we first planned it. I think the last time we did this was maybe summer of 2019. So it has been a while since we've all been together. Um, and we're thrilled that while it's virtual, we can still hear from all of you and, and share thoughts and, and good news. So Rodney, I'm going to put this over to you. It's all yours. Okay, well, thank you. Again, my name is Rodney Hathaway. I'm the County Administrator for New Kent. Um, I've been in this position since 2012 and I am still enjoying it. Um, I, I would like to, to thank you for including me and including New Kent County in, in the conversation today. You know, even though we are part of the Richmond Metropolitan Statistical Area, we very much see ourselves as part of the peninsula in Hampton Roads, and, and we do care and want to be active in, in, in this area as well. 
As far as what's been going on in New Kent County, um, the 2020 census has our population at 22,945, uh, which is changing daily. Um, and we're a small community, but our growth rate over the last 10 years was 24.5%, which is the second highest uh, in the Commonwealth behind Loudoun County. So even though we are small, uh, we are seeing a lot of change in this community and therefore planning uh, for our future is extremely important and on the forefront of um, New Kent County right now. We have just completed um, our strategic plan, which I believe is um, been the first strategic plan or formal strategic plan uh, prepared by, by the county. We are excited about that. And um, we are continuing moving to the next step with a rewrite. And I say rewrite and not an update of our county's comprehensive plan, uh, which we hope to work with this organization on that. I hope that our elected officials in the county will take a very serious look at housing uh, within our community. Historically, we've shied away from some type of some types of housing um, that I think we need to take a strong look at, <clears throat> and more specifically, rental housing and, and, and apartments, um, especially as we get more involved in economic development um, and looking at uh, providing a workforce to sustain um, larger types of economic development projects. Um, <clears throat> projects that, that we're focused on right now, uh, the top project is broadband uh, for New Kent County. Uh, New Kent County received, um, well, we'll be receiving $4.2 million in ARPA funding. We've received half, we'll, I believe, receive the next half, uh, March or April. Um, and we've dedicated that entire amount to broadband. Uh, we've also been sit setting aside money uh, for the past several years, uh, revenues from Colonial Downs, uh, and we've been setting that aside for broadband. Uh, we have a, well, had actually an RFP out uh, for an internet service provider that uh, we received proposals for last week, and we're in the process of meeting and meeting with those firms so we can make a selection of who we're gonna move forward with. The county's goal is to uh, provide fiber optic service to every single household and business in New Kent County. Um, and we, it's our plan to begin that process in, in, in this year, begin construction in, in this year. Other projects that we've been working on um, are you know, infrastructure and community facilities, really uh, trying to keep up with the growth demands and demands for services. Uh, we are looking at the construction of two new fire stations. Um, those projects uh, will begin the borrowing on those uh, within the next couple of months. Hope to break ground soon. Uh, the renovation of our historic high school facility into a community center. Um, also a new animal shelter. And we've recently received a permit uh, from the state uh, for a water withdrawal project, uh, really looking at uh, the existing state of our public utilities and uh, what's gonna be needed to sustain us and to sustain the growth that we're currently seeing. Uh, we have uh, developed a plan to withdraw water from the Pamunkey River. Uh, currently, all of our public water systems are from groundwater sources, which the state uh, has really, over the past several years, been pushing communities uh, to look for alternative sources of water. Um, that's a huge investment for us, just the treatment plant alone. Uh, we estimate at being about $40 million, um, so that, that it's going to be a big move for us. We're also uh, focusing on workforce development. Um, over the past several years, uh, we've been focusing on economic development. Uh, we're excited that we're gonna have some very exciting news uh, uh, coming up in 2022 and actually in the next several months. Um, but definitely as, as we look to attract more business to our community, 
Uh, we have to ensure that, that we have a, a workforce to sustain that and to attract businesses as well. Um, I'm excited about our partnership with Rappahannock Community College. We just received a Go Virginia grant uh, to establish a, a welding and machine program uh, utilizing one of our uh, former school facilities. Uh, we'll be renovating that uh, for that program and working in consultation uh, in cooperation with our um, high school regional career and technical center bridging communities, which currently serves five communities and is located here in, in New Kent County. Another focus of ours is site readiness. Uh, we have some opportunities, some real opportunities in the county to assemble some very large tracts of land. Um, we just need to get utilities and roads and all of that to them uh, so that they can support development. Um, a big push and a big focus of our efforts are going to be around exit 211 off of Interstate 64, where we have are working with a private developer that has about 1,600 acres. Um, and we have a project right now where we're extending utilities to that site and upgrading nearby existing uh, water and sewer services in, in that area. Um, that's it for right now. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, Rodney, I think um, you and I talked about this, I guess it was last week, um, the idea or really just letting you into the um, the knowledge base that much like what we've worked on with um, James City, with the city of Williamsburg, with York County and, and other communities, even down on the peninsula, we have been working with Dr. Stafford on a housing needs study and a, a market analysis for New Kent County, knowing that you all were going into a year for your comp plan update. And I, I think not to speak for the other um, executive management here, but I think what has been valuable in these housing reports has been the ability to use that data toward a planning effort and loop it into the comp plans and eventually into strategic plans and then into actionable items that strictly are for housing and, and somewhat land use and zoning related. So we are at the point where we have a few tweaks that probably need to be made to, um, to Dr. Stafford's report but you can expect probably within the next couple or so months, um, we will have that ready and looking probably toward a March or April timeframe where we will um, we'll ask if we can spend some time with you and your team and actually present all of that data to the county. And then it's yours to use whatever you wanna do with it. We, we give it to you literally in the form of written report and graphics and statistics, and then you will use it and, and ask us questions and we can go into deeper dives on certain sections, but just wanted to give you and, and the, the audience today, the idea that this is almost complete and we, we hope to be able to present it to you all in the early part of the spring. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Yes, thank you. It's, it's been a really good opportunity to do that with all of our local governments. And, and I think it's been a, a useful resource. So with, with that, Cindy, do you want to just, I know we only have about 10 minutes, but um, would you want to open up the floor to any questions that might be coming from our, our members? Sure, absolutely. I know we have one question that came in the chat that Allison submitted specifically to Rodney. So um, just she's, she's curious as to what's going on with the project at exit 211, the commercial use that's being seen developed there. Is there anything you can share with us on that? Well, we're seeing a lot of activity around exit 211. Um, you know, there's a large residential planned unit development that's been approved, Farms in New Kent. Um, that project is moving uh, rapidly, um, where um, they've just started clearing ground for the commercial section of that development. Farms in New Kent has approved for 2,500 homes, about a million square feet of commercial development, um, all kind of centered around the visitor center right off of exit 211. Um, right across the street from our visitor center is the commercial section of the Farms in New Kent, uh, which is being cleared right now. Um, there's gonna be some announcements soon about um, activity and actual businesses that, that will go in there. 
but the housing is, is moving rapidly um, in that, in fact, they can't build them quick enough, uh, which is kind of a theme around the entire county, um, which I'm hearing from the uh, realtors is that we don't have enough supply uh, to, to, to meet the demand right now, which is, is kind of a good thing, but, um, you know, th things are moving around exit 211. Great. Thanks, Rodney. It's good to see you and, and Scott and Michelle. I appreciate your time. And so if there are any, any of our agents that are on the call, if there's any questions that we'd like to open the floor, but I'll start with just one that I'm just curious about for our members. I know with COVID, we all kind of had to go virtual, right? And a lot of our staffs were working from home and remote, and there's been a lot of new policies. So I was a little little surprised that Scott said that his demand for office space is increased. So I know that with a lot of our workforce, there's that new demand to really work virtually if they can. So I'm just curious where each of you are with that. Do you have staff in and out of the office? Are you all back in the office so that if an agent walks into the office, everybody's there? Or what can you share with us about the availability of your staff in the office at, the at this time? You know, I guess we're all in a different place. I'll start for James. Uh, we are mostly in the office. We've had some renovations in some of our office spaces of trying to take cubicles and turn them into offices so that people have a, a safer space to work here in the office. Uh, we did have some of those discussions about do we need the same space going forward or will COVID change that? Uh, I think the expectation for local government is that we are here. That's been uh, something that most of us through COVID have figured out that we can do the work from home in a lot of cases uh, just as well, maybe better, maybe. Uh, and But my hope and what we've gotten better at, whether we're in the office or not, when you're communicating with us, you shouldn't know the difference. And I think we have gotten better at that. And so we do have policies now that allow telework. We were starting that with our social services because of space in their building pre-COVID. Uh, so they have an active program where a number of our social services staff do in fact work from home. They're very easy to monitor. You can see that they do 10 cases a day in the office. They're doing 10 or more at home. So they're very easy to be accountable for their workspace. And I think all of us in local government will have more staff that we offer that to. Whether we like it or not, it worked really well in some areas during COVID. Uh, but more importantly for recruiting and retention, it's expected. You know, the old guys like me want us all in the office. Uh, but I can tell you, our newer staff, they want to, they want some flexibility. And that's a way that I think if we don't adjust to allowing telework where it makes sense, we'll struggle to recruit talent to do work for us. And so that's going to be, I think, a positive benefit of COVID is that local governments that were struggling to get there or thinking they shouldn't, we all figured out that many of our staff can do that. And we're all sort of in various stages of what that means. We do have a policy where employees by department can ask to work from home on a regular basis. We have very few, that's 100%, but I have a handful where they're working two or three days a week from home. And again, the office is meant to be staffed, so you shouldn't notice the difference when you come to see us. Uh, we've gotten better at appointments. We've gotten better at remote working with things. So we just encourage that as an option, uh, make it less time for you and probably easier for those coming to us. Uh, but we're here to help in whatever fashion that might be for you. And yes, I think telework is part of our future as well. I'm assuming that that's probably on, on par for, for Rodney and Michelle as well. I think that's kind of the direction all of us are going, right? I think yes, it's- it is. I totally you, agree with what Scott said. Right, right. Yes. It kind of expresses very well where we all find ourselves um, today. Yes. And I, I think that I, I want to commend all of you because I know that it's not always easy trying to structure work patterns, especially what we all had to go through. So I commend each of you. I, I've never experienced any time I needed to call or reach out. And I know Susan experienced this too, is that you all were always there. We can always rely on you to answer our emails and, and get back to us. So we appreciate all that. But I know it's not something that just happens miraculously. It takes a lot of time and effort. So thank you so much for that. And that's, hats off. I say hats we off need to our unsung heroes, um, police, fire, streets guys water treatment plants guys um humans i mean there were things voting <laughs> there was things you just couldn't do from home and those people stepped up and um and did a great job keeping not only our employees safe but keeping the public safe as well we would like to welcome neil morgan to our call today he just was able to sign on just a few minutes ago and he's the county manager for york county hey sorry folks for being late uh what you all were talking about when I joined the 
meeting was what why I was late. <laughs> um, some I think COVID, we can give you a pass, Neil. COVID so. crises today. And um, some decisions about remote work and such. Oh, I know we're also weary of it. Weary is the only word that I can think of, but you know, we're, we're still getting the jobs done no matter what. Um, Cindy and, and Lynn, if you all are, are comfortable um, and if everyone on the, the program can give Neil a little bit of attention, um, can we extend this by a few minutes and, and keep going for a bit? Sure, I'm, I'm fine. I've got, I've got the time and we've, we've got the Zoom going. So if, if anybody needs to leave, feel free. We've got it recorded. So we're going to post this for our members anyway. So you can go back and re-listen and hear. So absolutely, Neil, we'd love to get an update of what's happening in, in York County. Well, sure. And I, I'm, it's too bad that I couldn't hear what everybody else said because perhaps I'll say some things that are redundant. But I just had a few comments sort of with the original assignment that I got from Susan about just giving a quick little overview of what was going on. So I'll just run through that real quick and happy to react or, or, or take any questions. Uh, you know, compared to a lot of places, uh, and, I'm, and I'm talking to an audience that I'm perceiving as a bunch of realtors, of course, uh, York County's a pretty quiet, calm, predictable place, uh, pleasant and safe. Uh, that's not to say we don't have plenty of challenges some of which it sounds like y'all were talking about when I arrived, uh, that go, but challenges that go beyond the, the craziness of the, of the pandemic. Uh, just real quick, a reminder of sort of our profile. We've got 70,000 citizens at this point. Uh, our decade long uh, growth rate uh, it really means about 0.7% uh, a year, 7% uh, over 10 years which is right exactly the Virginia County average growth rate. Uh, so nothing like, you know, Rodney or Scott. Uh, and some might argue, you know, about the right uh, pace of growth. Uh, we remain one of the wealthiest communities in Hampton Roads. We benefit from stable employers, well-off retirees, and low poverty rates. Our schools have excellent stable management and we continue to perform uh, at a high level uh, as probably is true for, for most of us. We're benefiting from the regional investment in uh, Interstate 64. Uh, it puts really the entire county uh, in a convenient location to commute either east or west uh, to the employment centers. And I think part of the residential activity in the North County can be explained by the, you know, improved interstate situation. Uh, our intention uh, is me speaking as the county administrator, but I believe this reflects the view of the board, is to remain the lowest taxed full service major local government in Hampton Roads. And there's a couple of caveats in the way I said that, obviously. So by uh, full service, I mean, you know, there are some places in the area that have lower tax rates, uh, but don't have full-time professional fire departments, for example. And that's not really a fair comparison. And when I say major, there's plenty of localities that are bigger than us, but we are a fairly consequential operation with uh, you know, 150 firefighters and soon to have seven fire stations, uh, new $25 million law enforcement headquarters and such. So we have, um, uh, I think we're in the sweet spot when it comes to taxation and services. Uh, perhaps our biggest achievement in recent years, and one that I obviously, you know, feel like I, you know, feel pretty good about, is we've really gotten real with our capital improvement plan. We've got about a $150 million six-year CIP that's uh, fully funded. We're really going to do the stuff that's in the plan, uh, and that includes, you uh, things ranging from a library, one fire station that we recently built, another that's underway now, the new law enforcement facility, and tons of infrastructure investments in stormwater and sewer and uh, sustainability, things like generators for all of our public buildings and things like that. And our schools are incrementally basically rebuilding all of our old schools. You're familiar with some of those. Uh, Waller Mills, Mentelli Redone, Yorktown Elementary, the Grafton Complex, 
Uh, we just got the bids in for Seaford Elementary, which is going to be totally redone over the next 18 months and others to follow. So that, uh, you know, meaningful, sustainable capital plan is something that I think most of us feel pretty good about here. Uh, our challenges, one that uh, some people around here seem, don't seem to care about as much as me, is uh, we don't have very much land. And uh, some people don't want anything to happen on the land we do have. Uh, our housing stock uh, will begin to age. Now, temporarily with new residential development, that's not the case, but it's going to resume the, uh, the 20 year trend of aging. So our built environment is inevitably aging. And some of you who know my background know that I'm somewhat familiar with that dynamic. And uh, I see that as a challenge in the future for your county, uh, not only as the houses get older and the retail areas get older, uh, but frankly, the average age of the person living in them gets older. Uh, those two things converging create a lot of challenges uh, that folks in your county will have to deal with you know, long after I'm gone. Um, Another one that might be of some interest to the realtor community in particular uh, is we have uh, the emergence of uh, what I would call uh, an anti-development dynamic in the community, uh, which you know we've all seen in different communities in cycles. Uh, and it's a pretty significant factor in the county right now whenever anybody wants to talk about any type of land use thing. If it's anything that's not by right zoning, uh, it's uh, a very difficult situation. And, um, you know, it is what it is. The, the part of that that kind of concerns me as the administrator is it kind of bleeds over into our administrative review processes where uh, people, that because they don't want something, feel like they have a right to get in the middle of even a by right administrative review. Uh, you know, I've got folks that think they're better at deciding how to coordinate with the gas company and the power company and waterworks and VDOT uh, than the county staff. And uh, it's got the potential to get out of hand. And um, then what, you know, a lot of normal folks don't really think about, but us local government types have to think about is um, external threats, long-term things. And uh, one of those is changes at the state level, things that you know most of us just don't spend any time thinking about. But for example, if the uh, grocery tax is done away with, the one cent that goes to localities, uh, that's $3 million out of the county's $153 million general fund budget. Uh, who likes a grocery tax? No one, but I haven't heard anyone uh, explain uh, a plan to replace the money. Uh, so I worry about that one. Uh, changes at the national level. We've all seen this in Hampton Roads before. You know, when I moved away and went to Southwest Virginia in 2013, I really, uh, I didn't really understand how much sequestration was going to affect Hampton Roads over a longer period. And, uh, you know, I came back in 2015, and really until 2018, 2019, uh, there was just a lot of stagnation in the Hampton Roads economy, uh, because everybody that's been around here knows that we kind of go the same way the federal government does. And I uh, think one of the reasons things have picked up more recently is sequestration came to an end and you know, funding for things like NASA and Jefferson Lab and all the military bases came back. But if you're paying any attention to federal fiscal policy, it's kind of hard to imagine that, you know, that kind of issue isn't going to reemerge. And it, if it does nationally, it will greatly affect all of us in a very short period of time. Uh, and then the last one sort of in that same category of external things that we can only do so much about uh, is the, the regional economy. And, you know, you've defined that in different ways. Some people on this call think of that as Greater Williamsburg. Some think of it as the mega region, you know, from Richmond to Virginia Beach, or maybe I think of it more in terms of the Virginia Peninsula. 
so we basically rely on three things, tourism, the port, and federal spending. And uh, sometimes some of us in our little local governments become deluded with the idea that, you know, if everything in our little place is okay, uh, that's all that matters. But, you know, localities like your county don't do well in the long run if some of our neighbors aren't doing well in terms of their, uh, the, the basic sector of our economy around here. So, and of course that also ties to federal and state stuff. So that's really my quick uh, synopsis. And, and I apologize again for being late and I don't wanna keep you all, but if you, if you care to engage or have questions, I'm, I'm certainly willing to, 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 to do that. And sort of as I've done with your, your colleagues and just um, share with you and thank you for the um, ongoing collaboration we've been having with Tim Cross and the, the team who's been working on the comprehensive plan. Um, we, we were able to have, um, again, some input into that process back in, I think it was really right at the end of December, 2019. And much like what we've done with the other communities, we had worked on some housing data um, with the county. And it was a collaborative effort between William and Mary and CNU um, with Dr. Sarah Stafford and Dr. Tom Hall. Since you know, York County for us is kind of bifurcated with the lower half of the county being in the Peninsula Association of Realtors footprint and here in the upper part of the county being in the Williamsburg Association footprint. So we collaborated with both institutions and I think came up with some really good information that we presented to the, the steering committee who's been working with the comp plan review. And Tim and I communicate quite often. So I'm hopeful that that's been helpful to you all. Yes. Um, I, I know like every community, Rodney touched on it. You know, the inventory has been an ongoing um, conundrum, particularly during COVID. Um, but I think these housing, housing studies and housing reports, even pre-COVID, pointed to the fact that we needed additional inventory, and COVID has simply exacerbated that um, in a very, very short fashion. So just know that we're here to be helpful. Um, we, we try to be as resourceful to you all as we can, so let us know what you need, Neil, but it's been great to be part of that process working with Tim. So we, we want to engage as much as you want us to. Thank you. Susan, before I hand it over to Lynn for just a couple of final comments before we, we sign off, I just want to thank um, Scott for, for filling us in in the chat on what's going on with our Long Hill Road development because I didn't want to bring it up because frankly, I was afraid of the answer that Scott would give because I don't know if Scott's aware, but the, the development that's happening right now, the road work that's happening has been right in front of the entrance to our office park. <laughs> um, for the last two months. So um, as our members, have, we opened up after COVID and are you know, inviting our members back into our classrooms and our um, meeting space. Um, that's what I hear every time is that they have, it takes extra time for them to get here to participate in things because of the work that's going on. But I do finally see some progress. I'm, I'm, I was hoping that you would tell me by the end of January that it would be finished because I kept saying all I want for Christmas is for the road work to stop. But it sounds like it's going to be about March before that happens. Is that right? Is that what I'm reading? That's what I put. Yeah, my hope is they'll open up lanes. It'll get better. Uh, just so you know, while I, I haven't heard from everybody along Long Hill, our human service staff has regularly updated me on the time it takes for them to leave and the challenge of getting to work. And mm -hmm. so, and I also hear from some board members that traverse that from time to time. So we're very aware of the challenges. The good news is it'll be done soon. It just may be still that March time frame before we get there. So thanks for the question. It's going to be great when it's finished. I know it's going to be a great improvement, hopefully safer for the students coming from Lafayette High School. So hopefully, is it going to, do you know if it's going to extend eventually all the way up Long there, Hill, Scott? There, there, is a, there is another project, but it's much further out. So it's not going to happen in the near term. And we'll see how the roundabout goes. I've heard mixed reviews on that. So we'll see how we all manage this roundabout that we've put in the middle of it to slow us down and provide access to the church and the timeshare properties. But I think it'll be a very good improvement of that corridor and I'm excited to get it done. So we'll be there soon. Great, well, thanks. Well, Lynn, I'm gonna hand it back to you for any final thoughts. 
Well, as somebody who's up at the association office quite a bit over the past few months, I can tell you I've never pulled out, got ready to leave the association office and tried to get on Long Hill that there was not somebody who was polite and stopped and waved me out no matter how far the traffic is backed up. So that is very positive for um, our association. That's a very positive, I think, for the people that, that we serve. Um, we have a very polite community in the Williamsburg area and all the people that traverse Long Hill Road and deal with the construction traffic. So one, I'd like to thank the four of you for coming and sharing with us. Um, your information is vital to us. We think we're vital to you because of what we can share, how we can help you get information out. Um, I know our members are always asking questions about what's going on and forums like this where we get information from you is vital to our members for them to share with their clients and customers. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate everybody who participated in this and we'll look forward to our next one. Susan, when is that? Or do we have a date set yet? Um, I think our next one is March, I believe. So we're trying to do these every other month. Um, and I, I'm wondering if, you know, just, I haven't asked Cindy or Lynn yet, but just hearing the information from all of our local government folks today, if maybe we shouldn't do something like this again, even six months, from now so that we can continue to hear what progress is being made and how we can just continue the, the conversations, just maybe something to think about. Um, but it is in March and we'll let you know how that comes together here over the next couple of months. Um, I did not want to, um, to close out without acknowledging that there was a question from Allison um, on the marquee that was directed to Neil. And I, I know, makes me sad to even ask the question or to repeat the question. I know it, we're, we're all kind of just bummed about what's going on over at the marquee, but do you have any insight, Neil, or? Uh, in, insight, insight, yes, positive news, no. Uh, and I, I did just see the question, I was scrambling around, I was, gonna, I was worried whether I was gonna type an answer before the meeting ended. Yeah, so, you know, there was a story in the Virginia Gazette the other day, which quoted me accurately. Uh, which pretty much sums up the situation. Fortunately, uh, I cannot take any of the blame for the structure of the marquee uh, TIF CDA. It's honestly not how a CDA TIF should be structured. Um, there's a couple of different problems that sort of converge. One is uh, the general overbuilt uh, bricks and mortar retail situation that's a far bigger issue than just the marquee. Uh, and then the second one is the marquee itself. The way that's structured, um, basically all the tax revenue has been given away for 30 years already. So uh, there, there are no incentives that the county, even if we wanted to, uh, you know, to cause something else to happen, um, there's nothing to give away. And, um, the, the, the building where Dix is in is owned by a REIT. And so presumably they have, you know, some incentive to look for another uh, occupant. Um, and, you know, I generally have the impression that Target does well. Of the other stores, I think they survive, speaking candidly, because the way the tax increment financing was used was to essentially subsidize their cost of operating there rather than building public infrastructure, unfortunately. So, and then, you know, the other big test is the old Penny's building, which we thought, and it still might happen. There was a, a big um, interesting uh, church, uh, I forget what they were called, but they have a Williamsburg congregation. And it's part of a uh, international franchise, I guess you would say. And they, they had a really cool idea where they were going to use it for a church, but also subdivide parts of it for retail use. And it was, you know, typically a local government type wouldn't be that excited about a church in a retail area. But in this case, we thought it was going to bring a lot of activity uh, and it might be a net positive. And that still might happen. 
but they've run into the uh, the Dallas owner of the remnants of the marquee who bought it up out of bankruptcy, who has the right to approve or disapprove of everything. And for some reason, he won't approve it. Uh, the county's taken all the land use transact, you know, actions it can. So I'm afraid it might get worse before it gets better. Speaking about the marquee in general. Well, sometimes you have to go to ugly before you can get back to pretty. So fingers crossed. But not to end on a downer note, um, there's more good than not going on in the region, that's for sure. And I know all of you cooperate and you communicate a lot. Um, we're just thrilled that y'all were able to spend some time with us today. I do think that the idea might be um, somewhat warranted to, to do this again sooner rather than later. And um, just know that while it looks like not as many people were on today, um, I cannot tell you how many members will watch this um, for you know, the next several weeks when it's put up on YouTube. So there will be a wide audience despite um, what looks not to be as many of our members who are actually able to join us at the moment. So um, just thanks again from me to all of you and know how much I enjoy working with you. And I look forward to, to making that happen a lot during 2022.